This is Halleck Hoffman speaking from the Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions in Santa Barbara. In the spring of 1968, the Center sponsored an international conference seeking to explore ways in which dialogue might replace the Cold War confrontation between Eastern and Western Europe. One participant was Herbert Marcuse, professor of philosophy at the University of California at San Diego and author of Eros and Civilization, One Dimensional Man, and Reason and Revolution. Between sessions of our conference, Professor Marcuse talked informally with Harvey Wheeler, political scientist and center fellow. Professor Marcuse, who enjoys a great following among the new left, is often referred to as one of the most influential thinkers in a relatively recent movement that is sometimes called Marxist humanism. Mr. Wheeler began the conversation by asking what the term means. The first thing that I'd like to find out about is what, uh, in brief, Marxist humanism means. I, I'd like to know how, in the first place, it differs from other kinds of Marxism, and then, of course, how it differs from other kinds of humanism. Well, you may know that I am not very happy about the term uh, Marxist humanism. Uh, to me, it is uh, somehow redundant. Yes. <laughs> and Good I uh, very much disagree with the widespread tendencies uh, to read only the early writings of Marx yes. and to find the humanism only there, completely disregarding the fact that what Marxist humanism really is, is in uh, Das Kapital and in the later writings of Marx, namely, uh, to put it as simply as possible, the building of a world without the domination of man by man, and without the exploitation of man by man. And in as much as uh, this new world uh, would require a completely different society with completely different institutions and completely different human relationships, Marx, uh, Marxist humanism is at the same time the theory and a strategy of uh, revolution. I see. Now... And I guess coming into this element in Marx would be the discussion of alienation and the elimination of alienation, which was part of what you mentioned about exploitation. Now, I'm familiar with three other kinds of humanism. There are probably thousands of them. But three prominent ones are what we sometimes call Renaissance humanism. And then there is a tradition that has come to be known as Christian humanism, and more recently, of course, we've been learning about existentialist humanism. Now, I wonder if you would mind distinguishing in some way those other humanisms, if they can be distinguished, yes. from what you have in mind. As to the first two, I would say that Marxist humanism is different because by it is meant a life, a form of life, of existence, in which men can determine their own way of living, determine their own needs, determine their own way of satisfying their needs, and of developing their needs, and in this sense to exist as free human beings on this earth, which distinguishes it very definitely and ultimately from uh, Christianity. From Christian humanism. From Christian Not necessarily humanism. from Renaissance humanism. Well, Renaissance humanism was a very confined humanism, confined to an intellectual elite, mm -hmm. uh, because a vast majority of the uh, population certainly did have a, neither have the means nor the time to uh, developing what is called their personality. They had to engage in the dirty work, and only a very a small elite actually was capable of achieving this humanist ideal. So you would, in a sense, say that what is shared by Marxist and Renaissance humanism is, in Marxist humanism, thoroughly democratized. Yes, thoroughly democratized. And now, as we all know, Sartre wrote this book, Existentialism is a Humanism, and is also then a Marxist and, I guess, it follows he's a Marxist humanist. But is there some distinction in your mind between Marxist humanism as you know it and have written about it and uh, the existentialist uh, variety? There's a considerable distinction. In the first place, I would like to say I don't think it is fair 
to refer today to Sartre's book Existentialism as a Humanism because he has explicitly and implicitly indicated Denied that it. he no longer holds his position and has politically mm -hmm. and theoretically gone far mm -hmm. beyond it. Well, in that case, we have to refer to the life that this doctrine has of its own That's without right. regard to his belief. It has been said in connection with existentialism, and I agree that the freedom of man, which extent existentialism at that stage defined, is a dreadful freedom. Yes. That is a, no more and no less than to be free to do what is necessary to do. Uh, for example, and that is in my view one of the most objectionable concepts in Sartre, he has maintained that man can be free even in a concentration camp because he always retains the liberty to reject his fate by protesting and being or shot. Now, I think this is a caricature on the uh, idea of human freedom, and he himself, Sartre himself, has gone uh, far beyond it. Mm -hmm. Now, as, uh, as you know, certainly, uh, you've become celebrated in a somewhat unlikely place, namely Time and Life, <laughs> yes. Time Magazine. I'm very much worried about that. <laughs> and uh, uh, this is enough to disturb anyone. Uh, but time well, you see, if I may uh, say that here, it is at the same time a beautiful verification of my philosophy. Uh, I that see. in How society that? everything can be co-opted <laughs> and everything can be digested. You've become part of the establishment. That's now. right. <laughs> if I can become part of the establishment, it serves me right. <laughs> now, Time Magazine has referred to you as the prophet of Europe's new left. And, of course, we know today that Europe's new left is in revolt. Now, uh, I, uh, first, I'd like to ask you to explain a little bit uh, what is new about Europe's new left and then uh, and what it is, and then secondly, how it is different from the American new left. Well, to the first point, and which is common to the American new left, the, they do no longer adhere to the old ideologies including Marxian ideologies, where these ideologies are obviously denied by the facts. There is no longer this exclusive focusing, for example, on the working classes as the only agents of change. And there is, and that seems to me most important, the conviction, the feeling, the deep, profound feeling that if a socialist society is not essentially different from the established societies, no matter how good they may be, it isn't worth fighting for. Now, is this a criticism against the Eastern collectivist that democracies? That contains a lot of criticism of the Eastern socialist societies, mm -hmm. which the uh, new left, especially in Europe, criticizes that this is still mainly uh, replacing one form of control and one form of domination by another. And here we get into discussions of bureaucratic uh, right. power and the new bureaucratic state analysis. Right. At the same time, however, they do believe, and I share this belief, that the uh, socialist societies of the East still have the potential and the possibility uh, to develop into a genuine socialism. They don't have the original sin of a property relationship that's right. at and their that's core. Right. That's right. And this gives them a possibility of ultimate freedom. Now, you mentioned that they have abandoned a certain, certain element of traditional Marxist class analysis. Uh, what because is it was abandoned in reality. Yeah, because, the, right. because life passed it by. Now, what is, and this is a curious question uh, in, for Marxism in general, it seems to me today, what is one to look forward to as the agency of revolutionary change if the working class is not any longer to be regarded as an agency of revolution? I have been bothered about this question for a long time, and I'm afraid I cannot give you a satisfactory answer. The only thing I can say is that it seems to me wrong to go around looking uh, for the agents of historical change. The agents of change uh, probably will come up and will become identifiable 
only in the process of change itself. What might cannot simply uh, become defeatist or withdraw by saying uh, there are no visible and identifiable agents of change. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Our work so probably creates uh, or helps to create agents of change. Well, now let, let's follow that just a little bit further, because uh, if one actually abandons the, the dialectical mechanism producing a revolutionary class, one has abandoned a great deal of Marxist theory in making that step. That's certainly true. Now, what would you make of the maneuver that is sometimes announced, namely that the agency of revolution is no longer to be looked for from inside the nation state, but rather on a world level in which what we loosely call the third world becomes yes. the external proletariat yes. and is in effect the the working class in Marxist terms of the entire West uh, and the industrial combine as if it were a class and that the dynamics of the Marxist revolution will work itself out in that way with the third world taking the role in the world at large that the working class was said to take inside a nation. I go a long way with this conception and even more, I think it is a genuine dialectical development of the Marxian conception. Uh, corporate capitalism today is a global system. And uh, what uh, may appear first as external proletariat is actually an internal proletariat. In terms because, of the world. In terms of the world, in terms of the global interest and the global power of capitalism. Mm -hmm. So very definitely the third world forces, historical heir of the Marxian proletariat, are in this sense within mm -hmm. the dominion of uh, corporate capital. Now this makes an interesting tie between, let us say, the movement of the African peoples and their struggle for mm -hmm. independence and freedom, and on the other hand, the struggle of the technically minority group inside America, namely uh, the Negroes. In terms of the world struggle, they cease to become a minority. And the argument we always make against the, the Negro revolution is, well, how can a minority pull off a revolution? But in terms of the analysis that we've been following now, they cease to become a minority, and they become a very, uh, very pot uh, potentially effective vanguard of a revolutionary movement. On the other hand, I don't think we can overlook that at this stage, the effective link between the black people in this country and in Africa are practically non-existent. Non-existent, yes. Spiritual. Uh, Mar you know, Coretta spiritual, King convinced yes. Martin Luther King that this link uh, spiritually should be made. Yes. And, yes. Uh, so but it is for the time being only a uh, matter of the future. Yes. Now, uh, well, let's come back to the, the new left because I wanted to get some feeling for what marks of difference there are between the European new left and the American new left. One of these marks, I would take it, is that while the American new left is not necessarily Marxist in foundation, one branch of it is certainly, but not all branches. The new European New Left is apparently a developing or an evolutionary Marxist orientation. Yes, a neo-Marxist. Neo I would say a neo-Marxist right. yeah. development, yes. Yeah. And are there any other differences that you can think of? For example, the American New Left is very, very emotionally involved in the struggle for participatory democracy. And this feeling for community, the word community, and building new communities that are essentially democratic and unalienated. Is there any of this strain in the European New Left? There is, but in a very different way, because the European New Left works and operates in a very different context. It operates in the context of societies where a large part of the labor movement is still at least potentially radical, Marxist and political, which is not the case in the United States. And therefore this... Uh, it has an ally of That's sort. right. Mm -hmm. And which so uh, in Europe, this participatory democracy uh, can assume much more concrete and real forms. Mm -hmm. For example, the uh, participation of labor in uh, management, uh, what they call co-gestion, auto-gestion. Mm -hmm. um, that is a new strategy of labor as advocated by Andre Gortz, for example, well, in Serge Malay. And, so and in Yugoslavia very strongly. 
Uh, but that in this country wouldn't make any sense. Yes, it make no sense at all. None whatsoever, yeah. because participation of labor and management would in, mean in no way any uh, radical political change yeah. to the better, yeah. perhaps to the worse. Yeah. Now, the papers today, of course, and we're speaking t uh, at a time that's just about the end of April, um, the papers today are, are full of the riots that have occurred and the demonstrations that have occurred in West Germany mm -hmm. over the incident that involved one of your disciples, <laughs> uh, and a very brilliant young man, I understand. I wonder if you'd say a little bit about him, why he is so significant. He appears to have almost a prophetic role. He appears to almost attract worship. And then also uh, something about the Springer Press and why uh, the feeling against it is so intense among the students. Well, I met the first, uh, this, this young man's name, Rudy Dutschke. Rudy Dutschke. Rudy Dutschke. I met Rudy only, I think, about a year ago in Berlin, and I was immediately taken by him and taken to him. He is a highly intelligent, honest, and uh, active uh, student. He's married to an American girl. He married an American girl, yes, a Chicago girl. Uh, he is, in my view, one of the great hopes of all those uh, who uh, work for a better society. And as I said to the German press agency when they called me the day after the attempted attentat, the great hope of all those who uh, work for a better society and for the abolition of the horrors of the established society. A man who is equally intelligent in questions of theory and of practice. For example, the way he organized demonstrations, found new forms of organization, and so on, is uh, absolutely amazing. I think that is all I can uh, say about him. I mean, the... the uh, well, you, you were going to say something about the Springer Press and oh why yes, the, Springer the Press, uh, well, feeling is so high. Uh, you know that, uh, the Springer, that the Springer concern had a monopoly of, I think, about 70 percent of, uh, of the decisive public opinion making newspapers and a magazine in Germany. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, this with is of the, of the national press. Of the, uh, of Berlin the, uh, and West Germany. Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, and there are many local presses, but his papers reach a national, uh, uh, a national, a national audience. Read a national audience, audience, that's right. Yes. And uh, he is fully supporting the war in Vietnam. Uh, his papers uh, have led for uh, more than a year a vicious campaign against the uh, student opposition. They are in favor of all the the uh, reactionary, in favor of yes, re all the reactionary policies in West Germany and Berlin, and their language was such that the attempted assassination of uh, Rudi Dutschke uh, to me didn't come uh, surprising at all. Uh, you wouldn't go so far as to say that there had been incitement. No, uh, you, you have to be careful in saying that. Yeah. But, uh, uh, look at the language of the papers, what have they been doing all these years, and then look at the... The Springer Press, however, is not, uh, strictly speaking, neo-Nazi, is it? Or would you say that uh, it has some overtones of being neo-Nazi? If you identify Nazism with anti-Semitism, no. He's because not anti-Semitic. Certainly yes. not. On the contrary, he was careful to give large amounts of money to Israel and to uh, Brandeis University. Oh, way. really? <laughs> oh, yes. Neo-Nazi in this sense, no. But uh, in the way in which I described it, uh, the exponent of all the repressive and aggressive policies mm. in Germany. So that he is, uh, in classical Marxist term, an apologist for <coughs> imperialism and colonialism, and neo-colonialism, I take it. I would say so. And that this helps explain uh, the animus of the students. I take it then, in addition to that, he represents a subtle new expression of the establishment of the power elite 
that makes him a of uh, a highly concentrated power yes, elite, and of, not a, of a new a new sophisticated type. Oh. So that his uh, influence is somewhat new for the continental European mind to to cope with. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, we, we've been accustomed to to your friends at Time Magazine exercising this kind of influence for a long time. So we take it perhaps a little bit too easily in our stride. But this is something in Germany. New. I think it is something new. Something new yes. in Germany, yes. Yes. yes, and that is part accounts for the violence of the reaction. Yes. Now. There's one other topic that uh, I'm curious about, and I know that you're very much aware of and, and interested in, uh, and we know really very little about this, but uh, we're told that there is a, an extremely exciting and very vital Christian Marxist dialogue taking place in Europe and indeed spreading to America, as witness the conference we're having here the conference that was held last year at the University of Notre Dame, and uh, these conferences between Christians mm -hmm. and Marxists are, are spreading like wildfire. In fact, I'm afraid they're getting a little modish and a little well, too fashionable. That's what I'm afraid of. I'm a, you know, we talked about that this morning. Uh, I'm afraid of that in this dialogue one ends by glossing over uh, the real differences. I'd like to ask you what you make of the Christian Marxist dialogue. What is it? and uh, what is involved? Are both sides making fundamental compromises or not? Well, that's just the point. We don't know yet. I mean, uh, don't misunderstand me. I would definitely say it is better to have these dialogues than not to have it. But on the other hand, I repeat, there is a danger of covering up or glossing over the real and substantial differences between Christianity and uh, Marxism. Right. Could you put your finger on what you think the most difficult Yes, is? Uh, for example, I can hardly imagine any Christianity without the transcendent element, without the commitment to Christ as the uh, Messiah and the faith, the belief in a world hereafter and this is absolutely contrary to Marxism, uh, which believes that uh, the human condition can and should be improved by man's own power, and that any promise of a world hereafter uh, can only serve to prolong or absolve the actual uh, suffering of man. Now, first with regard to the transcendence. Yes. There is, I guess, a possibility of suggesting that Herbert Marcuse in Reason and Revolution had in some sense a doctrine of transcendence. Yes, uh, you are <laughs> quite right. The only difference being that the transcendence I was talking of there is an empirical historical transcendence right. to a different form of society uh, where the uh, Christian transcendence is a transcendence out of this world to another one. All right. Now... The second question along that line is, is there not uh, this allegedly new breed of Christian theologian that develops or reduces or transforms Christianity into something like the transcendence and the doctrines that you yourself have uh, developed? Yes, but then I'm at a loss to say in what are sense they, they are still Christians. Uh, so if, if they join you, That's fine, right. they'll join you. <laughs> That's <with> right. <laughs> But uh, th that means that they're simply joining you. Yes. Uh, all right, that's, that's a good point. But the fact does remain, does it not, that the most exciting developments in Christian theology are developments along this line. And it is among the people who are making these theological developments that the Christian Marxist dialogue is taking place most actively and most fruitfully. Uh, yes, that is true. However, I would say uh, that the really great change in Christianity is rather represented by those Christians, priests and others, who actually join, for example, the guerrillas in uh, Latin America and fight with them. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, Rather they seem to be the real Christians. Yeah. And, We're talking uh, about the Basques and, uh, that's and right. these, these uh, that's right. were putting their doctrines on the firing line that's rather right. than in the seminar. That's right. I think that's a good point. Now, the question that is puzzling me with regard to the Christian Marxist dialogue is what difference does it make? Let's put it another way. How many Christians are there left in the world or, uh, anyway, and where is Christianity going? Why would Marxists want to engage in it? 
Uh, that depends on your definition of Christian <laughs> and Christianity. I All mean, right. if you take, for example, Kierkegaard's definition, I think very few Christians will be left here on earth. And the vast majority would uh, not consider Christians. See, what anymore. I'm trying to get at, it, perhaps a little facetiously, is uh, how significant is it, even if it exists? Is uh, what? The, the Christian Marxist dialogue. Does well, it mean it is, anything? It is significant in the sense, brings us together with our counterparts in the East, for example. Mm -hmm. That there is a real exchange of ideas. Mm -hmm. And that out of this exchange of ideas, perhaps... Uh, we are finding a means and ways of trying to prevent or delay the outbreak of new war, intensification of hostile coexistence or whatever it is. But I don't think we should uh, overrate the actual importance of these dialogues. Now, one of the most active leaders in the Christian Marxist dialogue is, of course, Roger Garodi mm. of France. And Garodi is uh, interesting for many reasons, but one of them is that he has seized upon Teilhard de Chardin as a bridge between uh, Christians and Marxists. And Teilhard de Chardin was, of course, a priest who was kind of a biologist and a kind of a theorist of evolution and a kind of a theologian. And some people say he wasn't any good at e any one of these, but he wrote brilliant books and very exciting books and very exciting ideas. So what I'd like to know is, uh, do you feel that Garodi is, uh, has a sound intuition here, and what is your own feeling about the work of uh, Teilhard? Well, all I can say is uh, I have read a little uh, Teilhard de Chardin, and I couldn't find out by any stretch of the imagination why he is so important in this uh, Christian Marxist dialogue uh, why he is so important for Marxists. It seemed to me along this line, uh, what you get is much more a transformation of Marxism into a semi-Christian doctrine than a radicalization of Christianity. I see. So you feel that Garodi has a somewhat reactionary uh, Well, reactionary role is too hard a word, uh, <laughs> but uh, if you press me, uh, I might be willing to agree. <laughs> okay. Well, I must say, I thank you very much for a You're very welcome. interesting and informative discussion. You're welcome. You have been listening to an informal conversation recorded at the Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions in Santa Barbara during a conference on East-West Dialogue. Harvey Wheeler, a fellow at the Center, talked with Herbert Marcuse of the University of California at San Diego. Parts of the conversation were later published in the July issue of The Center magazine under the title Varieties of Humanism. If you would like to receive a copy of that issue, write Box 4068, Santa Barbara. That address again, Box 4068, Santa Barbara. This is Halleck Hoffman speaking from the Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions in Santa Barbara. <laughs>